In the year 1900, what scandalous onstage actions led to an English actress finding herself at the center of a New York City court case? Find out on today's Footnoting History. Hey everyone, Christine here with an episode about acting, public morality, and the scandal that occurred when the two appeared to conflict at the dawn of the 20th century. Now, as the United States, and more specifically for our purposes, New York, approached the 20th century, it developed an increasingly two-faced atmosphere. On the one hand, vice and the ruining of morals became a major concern. An image was cultivated of an exceptionally upstanding community particularly featuring women who were supposed to be as pure as pure can be, representing the ideal American girl. A movement against prostitution was also growing, and by the end of 1900, New York even had a citizens' committee whose sole purpose was to investigate the social evil and suggest ways to remedy the problem. The temperance movement was picking up too, though it would take almost two decades before prohibition became the law of the land. Yet, at the same time, something entirely different was developing on the stage. The latter half of the 1800s saw the growth of a new theme among plays. That theme was courtesans, or fallen women. This fallen woman was typically shown as going from the chastely pure ideal to a life that was sinful and sexual, and she was all over the American stage in many, many incarnations. So the same country that was worried about the purity of its populace also enjoyed watching plays about the very women they were supposed to avoid emulating. It was this climate that would lead our protagonist to the courthouse. Our protagonist is English-born actress Olga Nethersall, and in photographs, so that you can picture this for yourself, she can be seen as having had large, almost luminous eyes, dark hair, and a nice, healthy figure. In 1887, when she was 17, she made her stage debut in Brighton, England, and she never looked back. Olga had a definite flair for the dramatic, and she built herself quite a career that included touring the U.S. multiple times and specializing in, of course, the fallen woman. She became famous for something that got termed the nether soul kiss. This was an incredibly lengthy kiss that led to many jokes about people timing her onstage kisses instead of watching them. She increasingly took power over her career and began to produce plays herself, which was somewhat rare for women at that time. And it was also the case when she came, not for the first time, to the United States in 1899. During this trip, she decided that she was going to debut a new piece called Sappho. She arranged for it to be written by Clyde Fitch as an adaptation of Alphonse Daudet's 1880s novel. Now, Alphonse had dedicated his novel to his sons, for them to read when they reached their 20s, and it serves as a warning against giving in to vice. It follows a young man named Jean, from a good provincial family, who goes to Paris to work his way up in consular service. He meets a captivating woman named Fanny, who was both older and more experienced than him, and they begin a scandalous sexual relationship that lasts for several years. Their liaison is filled with jealousy, rage, arguments, makeups, revelations about Fanny's not-so-pure past, and the crumbling of Jean's relationship with his family, all due to his continued association with his mistress. It ends, as all such moral tales must, with Jean being left to deal with the mess he has made of his life as a result of his poor choices. As for the title, it was called Sappho because Fanny, years before she met Jean, was an artist's model for a sculpture of Sappho, the ancient Greek poetess. In the novel, this sculpture is widely admired, and a copy of it even sits in the childhood home of Jean that he sees again when he goes to visit his family. So his family has a sculpture of his mistress and has no idea. That is one of the more interesting points of the plot. And if you're curious about it, 
I have put the link to a free English translation of the novel on the Footnoting History website. It's really very readable, so I highly suggest taking a look. Anyhow, I digress. So, in a world where plays about women who took lovers out of marriage was not really uncommon, the actual plot of Sappho was not particularly scandalous or out of the ordinary. It's kind of funny because it wasn't even new. By the time Olga had it adapted for herself, it had actually already appeared on the American stage in a version written by the novel's author, so she wasn't even breaking new ground in terms of choice of source material. But there were some key differences between Olga's adaptation and the novel, most specifically with the treatment of Fanny, and these differences veered off from the standard dramatic treatment of fallen women. Olga's Fanny was far more sympathetic than her novel counterpart. Her biggest crime is basically that she loves too much. She willingly does things like burn letters from her past lovers to show Jean that she loves him. This is a stark contrast to the very confrontational scene in the book. Also, her maternal instincts are brought to the forefront as her desire to raise the child she had from a past liaison and to give him a bright, respectable future is emphasized. These things made it look like a fallen woman actually has the potential for rehabilitation and redemption. That's the sort of thing that is the opposite of what the people who feared that American morality was being ruined want you to watch, because it could encourage debauchery and say that, hey, you can go behave however you want because later on you can completely fix it. Olga's Turn as Fanny premiered in Chicago on October 31st, 1899, prior to a tour that would land her in New York in February of the following year. The response to Sappho at the start was not as intense as one might anticipate for something that was chosen as a podcast topic because of its scandal. The plot itself was rarely called into question half as much as Olga's daring costumes and sensational acting choices. By modern standards, the reviews would likely be considered mixed, but tickets still sold and the New York press would work itself into an absolute fit at the prospect of this production ruining its people. Yes, it was the New York press that led the crusade against Olga and Sappho. Before the play even opened in New York, the New York Times published an article condemning the hysterical media coverage which counted the world and the New York dramatic mirror among its participants. But the Times also suggested that maybe the play should just be banned altogether for the good of the country at large. That, of course, did not happen. And while the Herald said that Sappho offered a lesson about the consequences of breaching moral laws, the rest of the press was not that taken by the play when it finally did open in New York. Some critics merely shrugged at it. Some audience members said they thought it would have been more risque, while others continued or began their condemning of it outright. Attention was drawn to how shockingly low cut Olga's dresses were and to how well they alluded to nudity. Her smoking on stage and in some promotional images she's even seen holding cigarettes was also cited as scandalous. Though I have to insert here that in the novel, Fanny is rarely without a cigarette. So while Olga made the unconventional choice to show that on stage, it is actually something that came from the book. And above all, there was a scene, the most shocking thing in the world, according to the press, that involved a spiral staircase. In it, Jean, after escorting Fanny home, picks her up, and carries her up the spiral staircase and into her room, and then does not come back down. Seriously, this scene is mentioned constantly in press coverage. Even at the time, this was known as the infamous spiral staircase scene. That is how much it became embedded in the minds of the people who disliked everything Olga represented. How could such behavior, being paraded in front of the public, be tolerated? Well, many thought that it should not be. Only a few weeks after the play opened, the situation reached a boiling point. Olga, along with her co-star Hamilton and two managers associated with the production, was arrested. 
This was due to a complaint filed by a man who said that he saw the play, and he is quoted in the Evening World as having called it the portrayal of the life of a depraved and dissolute woman enacted in such a way as to offend public decency. Yes, he does cite the staircase scene as one of his main problems. Oh, and by the way, I need to point out here that the man who filed the complaint worked for a New York newspaper. Dun dun dun! See how it all comes kind of full circle? The accused received a blanket indictment. This indictment called them persons of wicked and depraved mind and disposition who contrive to corrupt the morals of people and create lustful desires in their minds. They committed public nuisance and offended public decency through, ready, stay with me on this one, lewd, indecent, obscene, filthy, scandalous, lascivious, and disgusting motions, as well as indecent postures and attitudes and utter indecent, obscene, and disgusting words and conversation. I suppose that you could summarize all of this as condemn the play, save the world. Olga's response to the charges was to say that she didn't commit any offenses against the morality of the United States or any other country, and that she looked forward to a speedy investigation. Though it was reported that she suffered from severe strain due to the trouble she was encountering, for the most part, performance did continue. That is, if you can call having increased crowds who are very vocal and shout their love and support for her throughout the production as a normal continuation of things because it was really quite a different atmosphere. Eventually, the police closed down the play until the pending trial. And what a trial it was. The newspapers did not let up on their debates over the morality of Sappho during this time, nor did public interest wane. Instead, the people who usually would have flocked to the theater to see what all the fuss was about went to the courthouse where they could instead see these people in person. There, they got to watch disputes about whether or not things like the infamous staircase scene, Olga's costumes, and other staging choices sought to make Vice seem like an attractive alternative. Everyone wanted to know. Would she and her associates end up in prison for the production that had become a must-see theatrical event in the eyes of the general public? The final day of the trial naturally had everyone chomping at the bit with excitement for the grand finale. Crowds packed the courthouse on that April morning with, according to the New York Times, a proportional increase in female attendance from other court days. If you want to picture Olga, you should know that she wore a turquoise velvet hat with a turquoise silk dress and a long sealskin coat. Once everyone settled down, the closing arguments were given, and they were as long as they were intense. The defense claimed that the whole thing was the result of a conspiracy by the press in order to revive the dying circulation of newspapers, and throughout his speech, Olga wept openly. Then the prosecution countered by saying that all the jury needed to do was consult the text of the play to see just how awful it was. The judge then reminded the jury to examine the facts and to remember that they were not the guardians of the morals of the community or part of any crusade against vice. Then he said that at the new building of the Supreme Court, quote, you will see the figure of a woman with more of her person exposed than the defendant nether soul herself. There has been no movement to remove this statue, end quote. So I guess his opinion about the whole thing was made very clear to everyone in the room. It only took about 15 minutes for a decision to be reached, and when it was announced that Olga and company were acquitted of all charges, it was met with cheers. The overjoyed defendants took time to thank each juror for the verdict, and there was much hugging. The newspapers note that, specifically, all of the women in the courtroom rallied around Olga to congratulate her. The crowds even followed her as she left, shouting and celebrating. Later, Olga would be reported as saying that a jury of the great American public had endorsed her play. And indeed, it seemed that the American public had sided with her. Not only did Sappho reopen to bursting houses, but multiple road companies were authorized to take the headline-making staging to other locales, and it even inspired the creation of a Sappho-themed burlesque. 
Although Sappho closed in May of 1900, and it's sort of funny to think that all of this craziness happened around a production that was only in New York from February to May, it was not the last time Olga would play Fanny. Even her final New York stage appearance a few years later revisited the role. But what came of Olga after this scandal? She continued to act until World War I served as a catalyst to change her life. She abandoned acting, and she served Britain in a nursing capacity that later led to founding the People's League of Health. The People's League sought to aid and educate the British people in order to raise the standard of the population's health. Eventually, this work would cause her to be awarded Associate of the Royal Red Cross and to be appointed to the Excellent Order of the British Empire. She had clearly done her best to improve the lives of her countrymen and women. When Olga passed away in 1951, her obituary appeared in the New York Times. Harkening back to the Sappho scandal, it said that for Americans, she represented a growing revolt against the prudery of the turn of the century and that she encouraged women's intellectual independence. So it seems that whether she was acting or trying to aid the public's health, Olga Nethersole left her mark. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.